Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, hi, my name is Gaiman Yi. I'm the technical director of I4 Energy Center. Welcome, everyone, to uh, uh, today's I4 Energy um, seminar. Um, both uh, my co-director, uh, Gary Ball, and I would like to welcome you, and also uh, welcome to uh, those that are viewing the seminar via the web. Um, I have the pleasure to introduce today's speaker, Dr. Nathan Oda. Um, Nate is a former student here, so uh, welcome back to uh, Berkeley. Uh, Thanks, Cameron. Um, he actually, uh, while a student here, he actually worked on uh, some of the state-funded energy research here, that, the projects that, that I managed. Um, following uh, graduating from Berkeley, I'm sorry, let me, before that, he, he has a PhD from, from <laughs> Berkeley in mechanical engineer, engineering, and he also holds a... Uh, Management of Technology Certification from the Haas uh, School of Business. Um, after graduating from Berkeley, he formed a, uh, he co-founded a company called Microclimates, which is a, a sort of a, a commercialization of the uh, energy management uh, technology that, uh, that, was based, uh, that was based on his doctoral research. Um, Currently, he manages consumer solutions and uh, home area network technology for Trillion, uh, a leading smart grid solutions provider. Uh, he represents Trillion as a member of the board of directors for the Demand Response and Smart Grid Coalition, and in re related standards development efforts at uh, NIST, OpenGS, and USNAP. Uh, his, his talk today is about uh, wireless technology in the smart grid, so let's give a warm welcome to uh, Nate Oda. Okay. Well, good afternoon. It's great to be back. Boy, I miss Berkeley. It's good to see some, some familiar faces. Um, just a quick question. Who knows what smart grid is? All right. Excellent. This is going to be an easy crowd. <laughs> second, second question. How many engineers do we have? Policy folks, excellent, excellent. Business folks, all right. It's about 50 to one to one, okay. <laughs> I'll gear the talk towards more technology then. Uh, so Gaiman, thanks for the, the warm introduction. Um, as you mentioned, uh, I have a pretty, pretty deep uh, technical background in wireless technology and how to apply it to uh, energy efficiency. And what I do now is apply it to the smart grid. Um, so what I'd like to, to talk about today is, is kind of an overview of, of what Smart Grid is, kind of the different applications that people are talking about, uh, what you might do with this infrastructure that we're building out today, um, and then talk about some of the architectures that go along with the wireless infrastructure associated with Smart Grid. And we'll go through uh, kind of different levels of a network from a wide area network uh, that's similar to a, the cell phone system that we have today to neighborhood area networks that you might consider uh, AMI networks or smart meter networks, and then talk about home area network stuff as well. Uh, I'm not sure if anybody in here has heard of Zigbee, but there's a lot of going on in, in the consumer space right now. So smart grid is, uh, could be described in, in many different ways. Um, from an application standpoint, uh, you have things that go on in your home. So topics like demand response, where you have smart thermostats connecting up to the grid and responding to price signals, uh, is, is one that, that I worked on here, and I know many people in this crowd uh, also work on. Uh, it's, it's historically been associated with meters. Uh, so smart meters started in California many years ago. Um, smart meters in general have been going on for about 20 years now. Uh, and, and really, that was the, the impetus behind a lot of the, the early days of, of wireless technology in the smart grid. And there's another area of, of the grid that doesn't get a lot of attention, uh, but is very, very important, which is distribution uh, and transmission efficiencies and, and how to make that part of the grid better. Uh, involved in that includes uh, distributed uh, generation, like photovoltaics at the utility scale, uh, distributed storage at the utility scale, as well as the residential scale. And people even start to talk about plug-in hybrid vehicles, which really is a, a transmission distribution uh, issue. Sometimes it overlaps into the home, but it's really a, a T&D issue. From, from a technologist standpoint, for someone who, who puts on his engineering hat, there, there's just a ton of stuff here. It's, it's really exciting. For the policy folks in the room, it's also equally exciting. 
because in the next 5, 10, 15 years, as the United States rolls out this kind of infrastructure, as the world rolls out this infrastructure, you'll fundamentally purchase electricity differently than you do today. From a business standpoint, uh, there's a lot of opportunity here, anywhere from creating communications chips to creating uh, services businesses to address utility problems. So there's, there's something for everyone in the smart grid. What I'd like to do today is really kind of talk about the technical uh, underpinnings for these kinds of applications um, going forward. And I'll just jump in and give an example. So uh, selfishly, the company I work for, Trillion, uh, has been around for the better part of 20 years. Uh, it started out as uh, a company making meters that had basically cell phones in them uh, to give very simple data back. A few years ago, they got a contract to roll out for a Hydro One, which is in Ontario, California. It's basically the PG&E of Ontario. So a little over a million meters, uh, several million customers. And what they did was basically said, by 2010, everyone's going to have a smart meter and everyone's going to be on time of use rates, which means you're going to pay a different electricity price depending on the time of the day. They're pretty close to that. Uh, today, there's uh, about 1.1 million meters installed in Ontario. Uh, they are all communicating together in an RF mesh technology, so a large mesh uh, network. Uh, and people are being billed on time of use rates. So it was really a forerunner for what the United States is doing today with the stimulus money that you're probably aware of, uh, activities in China and Europe as well. And Hydro One was, was actually pretty uh, forward thinking about what they thought of when they said smart grid architecture, smart grid wireless technology. On the left, which is the meters, is what everyone has been thinking about for the last mm, seven, eight years. The picture on the right is what they envisioned back in 2001. And it's really not just a meter uh, network for meters, it's a network for uh, wind generation to put in uh, intermittent resources. You have to balance uh, that with uh, generation. Uh, things like distribution uh, system automation, which is on the left there. And as you go, as you go around to the, the right side of the picture, you include things like mobile workforce. So guys in trucks go around and fix things you know, like poles and fix meters. For them to get onto this network using uh, mobile devices or even uh, a Wi-Fi enabled handheld, that was envisioned as part of the smart grid infrastructure. And all of this is wireless. So connecting not just the consumer, but wind and renewables and workforces and all kinds of stuff. So really when we talk about wireless technology in the smart grid, we want to talk about something more than just meters, something more than just smart thermostats. We really want to talk about connecting a lot of different devices and a lot of different people across an entire region. So think about that. Basically, Ontario, I'm not sure what the square mileage is, but you know, roughly maybe twice the size of California. And it's all connected by one network. That's a huge network. So when, when people started thinking about smart grid uh, 2000, 2001, they drew a really simple diagram on every single PowerPoint slide that you would see circa that, that time frame. And it was basically a smart meter and a cloud, right? The, the famous PowerPoint cloud that said AMI network. And then on the other side of that big cloud was the head end system or the enterprise software system. And it was thought that you would deploy one mesh network and it would connect everything from meters to plug in hybrids to uh, wind power through, through one network. And as people have become more sophisticated in the kinds of applications that, that they're thinking about running over this wireless technology, connecting all these devices, you quickly realize that the bandwidth provided by that initial cloud wasn't sufficient. So at the very bottom, you had things like AMI or smart meters. And you're talking very, very low bandwidth requirements to get you know, uh, interval reading from the meter to a uh, utility back-end office once a day, that kind of stuff. And then you get a little bit more fancy with things like demand response, where you want to send a price signal to somebody's thermostat to, to shed load when the grid is, is in distress. And as you go up, you start layering up all the requirements that you need over this network. And it turns out to be quite a lot. There's no way this initial bubble that everyone pictured would handle this kind of uh, bandwidth requirement, latency requirement, reliability requirements. And so over the last five years, industry has really kind of migrated to going, gosh, smart grid is, is more than just 
uh, connecting meters. It's having to deal with all these kinds of network applications running on top of it. So here, kind of walk through some of these applications again. I, I know I, I posed them at the beginning, but taking uh, a step deeper and maybe some of the technical uh, aspects of it. So generation, transmission, and distribution. You have things like reclosers, uh, uh, cap banks, uh, volt var monitoring. These are all things that if you go out on the street and you look up at your the electricity pole, those are that's the stuff hanging up there. Those are the big gray cans. Um, you have advanced metering, of course, uh, and it's not just at your home. It's commercial industrial customers. Uh, it's it's gas meters. Uh, some some companies have water meters in there as well. And then, of course, the stuff that goes in your home, smart thermostats, uh, little devices that show you how much your electricity is costing at any given time. Those are called in-home displays. And eventually, plug-in hybrids will go in there as well. Um, and, and if you look at what that means uh, for performance, I know we, we, we had the, the stair step here, but it's, it's useful to look at what the performance requirements are uh, from, from an engineering standpoint. So you're, you're looking at applications that range from uh, you know, bits per second, like a smart meter, all the way up to megabits per second. So for example, when you have your plug-in car uh, charging at home, you want to download uh, the data from the day and, and analyze how well your car worked. Latency uh, can vary drastically in this smart grid network. Uh, millisecond uh, requirements are not unheard of, particularly for demand response. So for example, um, you have 10% of your population with a smart thermostat. So of a million customers, uh, you might have 100,000 uh, smart thermostats in there. And you want to do a, a very quick dispatch of, oh my gosh, the grid is in, is in distress. Let's offset your, your temperature. So you really have to be on the order of milliseconds to all of those devices in order to get a system level reaction uh, that is meaningful for, for the grid. Uptime. Uptime is, is very difficult. Uh, some applications, it can be spotty. So, if you don't have your IHD working, you might not get a price signal, not the end of the world. Uh, grid reliability, keeping it at 60 hertz, uh, many nines reliability in order to get that kind of uh, system performance. Scalability is, is one that, that people really kind of missed in the first few years. Uh, when you talk about smart meters and you go, gosh, you know, the, the 1.1 million meters in, in Ontario, that, that's an enormous mesh network. I mean, that's, that's a network that, that rivals any of the other telecommunication networks in the world. And then you go, well, for every house, there might be a thermostat and a home display, a smart washer, a smart dryer, a plug-in. And all of a sudden you go, wait, wait, wait. The meters were just one-tenth of all the devices. So now your network size in terms of nodes for the networking engineer here, in, engineers in here goes from 1 to 10x the size. And that will happen over the span of 5, 10, 15 years. So very, very fast network growth. And the last one I'll just touch on, because I know it's, uh, we'll talk about it a little bit later, which is uh, range. So the, the network that Hydro One has was a mesh network. So you can go hop to hop and extend that range between nodes. There's other systems in the smart grid that use tower base, so it's point to point. And really, you see this drastic uh, disparity between ranges. So one meter in a, uh, to another meter in a mesh network might be on the range of uh, tens of feet if you have houses close together. And then you go to the backhaul. Uh, so for example, getting that information from homes back through wilderness areas. You're talking about link ranges that are on the order of miles, tens of miles even. No discussion about smart grid would really be complete without standards. And there's a slide later, but I'll, I'll, I'll put it up here just to, to pose it, because it is an interesting uh, aspect to wireless technology in the smart grid. Uh, stimulus money from the Obama administration was roughly $4.5 billion to smart grid. That'll buy about 40 million meters in the United States. That cover between a third and a sixth of all the homes in the United States. One of the catches with the stimulus money is that it had to be standards-based technology. The problem was, there weren't any standards in the smart grid space. Yes, there were some in wireless technology. Yes, there were some in, in uh, enterprise software. But by and large, there wasn't a body of standards that really encompassed all the things you had to do in smart grid, from wireless to data models to uh, enter enterprise systems. So NIST, the National Institute of Standards and Technology, was charged by uh, Congress basically to go find out what all the standards were, if there were any that were missing, 
facilitate industry to develop those or, or modify them. And so today, actively, uh, there's about 50 to 75 standards that are actively in, in development or modification uh, in order to support stimulus money. So there's a huge, huge spectrum of, of what standards uh, define in the system. And future-proof. This is, you know, I hate to use a marketing term here. I, I even hate the word future-proof. But think about it this way. A meter has a lifespan of about 20 years, uh, at least on the books. It really lasts about 30 years. So you install this thing on the side of your house. It'll be there basically until I retire. Now, you have technologies like the things above it, like in-home displays that are consumer electronics. They change at about a rate of every two years. So you have this really strange dynamic in the smart grid where you have to have technologies that change every few years, interoperate with technologies from 10, 20, 30 years ago if we look into the future. So there's, there's a really big challenge with how do you, how do you find and how do you uh, mitigate these interoperability cha challenges and create things that will work for a consumer uh, for 20, 30 years going forward. So given that we, we saw a case example and, and all of a sudden you said, wow, you start to stack all these, these bandwidth requirements up and you, all the way you get up to megabits per spec second, the way the industry has challenged in the last five or has changed in the last five years is instead of having that one bubble in the middle that connects meters to the back end, you start to see multiple networks being layered together. So a multi-tier architecture is, is evolving. And this typically has, has been you know, more or less the, the architecture for some systems where typically there's an AMI system to connect smart meters and you might use cellular backhaul to go from a neighborhood back to the back office. Over the last few years, it's become much more sophisticated. And we'll talk about this in depth in the, in the following slides. But just to set it out, this kind of frames the rest of the talk. Uh, at, at the top, the blue boxes are things you might have uh, at the enterprise level. So software that the utility might use, software that other service providers might use. And when you look into the field, uh, you have three big architectures. One is something that's, that's called the wide area network. So this is you know, that, that range of tens of miles it's very low uh, bandwidth, basically a broadband access at this level. And that provides backhaul capabilities. The tier that hangs underneath that is, is a neighborhood area network. It, it, it's what connects the smart meters together. You might have range of miles between nodes. Um, you know, this is the million node network uh, that exists in, in uh, Ontario today. And if you go zoom in into inside the home, you have, you have a home area network. So these are things like Zigbee devices and Wi-Fi devices and Z-Wave devices that are all supposed to make our lives better by saving us uh, money and, and helping us meet our, our carbon footprint goals as consumers. And all these networks have to interoperate to provide one seamless experience for the users of this network, whether it's a utility or an energy service provider or, or the consumer. So... That was the general one, and, and just to, to really make this conversation, which I, I hope this becomes uh, you know, fruitful, let me go in and talk about what, what Trilliant does in terms of addressing this multi-tier architecture. Um, hopefully I can get through these slides in the next 10 or 15 minutes and then open up for, for a longer Q&A, but this will help kind of uh, spur on some of the questions. So the multi-tier architecture we just talked about, um, this is what Trilliant makes. So basically all the red nodes are those wide area devices, and we'll go into some slides that you'll see pictures of these, of these devices. That wide area network of those red dots connects up to the blue dots, which are meters and um, gas meters, electric meters, and then within those, uh, that cloud of blue dots, you have the home area network. So this just kind of frame it. So think about red dots, blue dots, and gray dots. So this is what a wide area network looks like. Uh, this is a one node, so the, the can on the top of that tower is a, a wide area network node that Trilliant makes. Um, it's about the size of a traffic cone, a little bit wider at the top. Uh, it basically connects up with other nodes like this to form the backhaul network. Um, inside that box looks something like this. So if you can see the diagram down here, there's actually an array of eight high-gain antennas. Uh, you provide basically directional connectivity between uh, those devices in the wide area network to form an RF mesh network. So the links between those devices are on the order of 10, 10 miles. Uh, 
miles. Uh, you, have a, you have a mesh network that forms up uh, using standard technology. So this, this product works at 5.8 gigahertz, which is an important point to note that it's in the unlicensed, unlicensed spectrum, which means it's very easy to take uh, uh, through many regions and, and even internationally. And basically, all these nodes form this mesh, very, very deterministic network, millisecond latency, broadband capacity, uh, and it's basically like having an Ethernet line that you can plug into uh, and cross an entire region. So think of this network going across all of California, and that's equivalent to what's in, in Ontario. Um, it, it uses mesh networking, as I've, I've, as I've said. Uh, within this, this wide area network, you have other things that become really important when you have these multiple applications going on. One is traffic management. So this means that when, when your uh, plug-in car plugs in and wants to go synchronize with the utility to get rates, that, that traffic goes through that network and it has to compete with smart meter network, critical, mission critical uh, network traffic for things like uh, reclosures or generation systems. So traffic management becomes very, very important in the wide area network. Uh, and then RF management as well. Um, again, this is really about using that, that uh, unlicensed band. Um, there are some technologies out there that use licensing. Uh, it turns into a challenge when the customer, like the utility, actually needs to, to go and buy this and has uh, business issues around single source. So just to dive in a little bit more to really kind of form this up so, so you guys have a good feel for what a wide area network does in the smart grid and, and how wireless connects up. This is a recloser. So again, if you go outside and look on, on the, the pole, you'll see something that looks like this uh, picture here. Basically what happens is if in the electric grid something goes wrong and there's too much load somewhere, uh, faults start to happen. Think of it like big fuses that you might have in your home where you've used too much like, electricity. Uh, it, it cuts it off to prevent full network failure. Reclosers basically you know, reclose those lines and get electricity back to the homes. Here we're talking about uh, you know, functionality and requirements that really are, are close to SCADA in terms of how fast it has to op in, uh, operate. Uh, and this is really a wide area network uh, device. So you'd have thousands of these devices within a utility territory operating in that wide area network to get that kind of latency and that kind of uh, bandwidth requirements between the head end, so the operator who has to reclose all of these. And if you zoom up, oops, if you zoom up a little higher, and, and what does this network look like? Uh, again, you have, basically you go to the substation, which if you ever drive around, uh, usually in the, in the Central Valley, you see these big gray uh, installations with, with barbed wire around them. Those are the automation, uh, the, the substations. You have a wide area network that connects up all the things we just talked about, including uh, uh, reclosers and cap banks and all that kind of stuff. So that's just one tier of the network. So those are the applications that sit there. The layer under that multi-tier network uh, is the neighborhood area network. And this just means uh, things that are kind of from home to home, a um, little bit less on the, on the requirements. But just to give you a sense of, of what kind of equipment uh, exists and what it looks like, you know, these are the blue dots, as we talked about. Uh, you have meters. So Trillian uh, makes a communications board that gets embedded into these meters. Uh, they can be you know, GE or ITRON or, or any of the big meter companies. We basically embed a little meter in there. And all the meters create a mesh network. Sometimes you need things like repeaters where you have a farmhouse that's maybe 15 miles way out into the country. And basically the repeater acts to, to hop through. So again, you're, you're leveraging that mesh technology. Usually they look like the gray blocks and they're plugged into a power source. So typically you have poles and different assets that a utility can go out and, and have a guy go nail this to or screw it into a, a, a street light or something like that and tap power. Um, there are some cases where that doesn't work because you don't have power or it turns out to be really costly to do. And that's a little uh, black gizmo on the left there. Um, this thing basically has a clamp. It's about the size of your hand. And you go and you clamp that to a power line, just like the ones you see over, overhead as you walk down the street. And it energy harvests uh, power from the line and powers that radio that's inside it. So for the folks who work on energy harvesting in here, that's actually uh, an example that goes on in, in the real world. Um, they have a number of those deployed in uh, Ontario. So all of the repeaters and meters create this huge mesh network. 
uh, and that flows up to the collector. And collector is basically takeout points. And you might have you know, a few collectors for a whole bunch of these end devices down here. The collector bridges the neighborhood area network to the wide area network. Like uh, the wide area network, which was in the, in the unlicensed band, using standard hardware and standard uh, protocols, uh, the, the solution that the Trillion has uses uh, 2.4 gigahertz uh, 802.15.4 radios. So if you know anything about Zigbee, these are basically the same radios uh, that Zigbee uses. They're basically ruggedized, uh, built up to really be kind of utility class. But just as we talk about standards and, and how that plays into the wireless technology and the smart grid, um, you know, this, is, this is, becomes a big point. Not a lot of technology on this slide. You talk about you know, a well-established standard, uh, long-term component supply from, from major manufacturers, you know, a bunch of people who worked on radio performance. Um, this really comes into play when a company goes, gosh, I'm going to buy an asset like smart meters or, and smart grid infrastructure that's got to last for 30 years. You don't want to go out and buy single source proprietary technology. The really the impetus is on finding things that are standardized, things that have multiple suppliers. So even though the discussion today is going to be a lot around um, technology and those aspects around the, the engineering side of things, it's really important to, to appreciate that standards and, and open standards and open hardware, uh, standards-based hardware, excuse me, uh, plays into the whole discussion around smart grid. So below the wide area network was the neighborhood area network, and below the neighborhood area network, you know, conceptually, there's the home area network. Uh, the home area network is you know, all the cool things that you and I are going to play with. Uh, In-home displays, smart thermostats, um, plug-in hybrid electric cars, having your photovoltaic system hooked up to this whole grid so you can basically become uh, energy or, or, or neutral, carbon neutral. Um, this is an example that, uh, tr of a trillion deployment just to give you a sense of, of what this might look like. Um, basically, we gave a, a lot of devices, including these in-home displays, but as well as thermostats and, and load controllers, which are the old version of thermostats to so turn your air conditioning off. Uh, gave them to a bunch of folks in uh, Louisville, Kentucky. Uh, you can kind of see an aerial photo of, of how big that area is. It's, it was miles and miles uh, wide. Working exactly uh, alongside the meters. So one of the things that, that Trilliant does, and it's a bit interesting when you talk about architectures, is uh, we put the same radio module in these in-home devices as goes into the meter. So from a networking standpoint, they're peers on the same network. They all created a wireless mesh. They ran uh, CPP events, which means they sent price signals down to thermostats, and those thermostats automatically turned up the, the air conditioning on, on hot days. And it was really helpful to Louisville Gas and Electric because they saved on, on all kinds of costs and avoided blackouts and that kind of stuff. So this is kind of what it looks like when you, when you deploy these technologies in the field. Um, you might be thinking, gosh, I, I always thought that you had you had a meter, and the smart meter had a Zigbee chip in it, and under the meter, you have your home area network. And he just said that these devices were peers on the same mesh network. Turns out there's, there's about a half a dozen different architectures in the home area network. And personally, this is what I work on every day, so it's, it's uh, interesting for me. Um, for about five years now, uh, every utility who's deployed smart meters has chose to do uh, a meter as a portal architecture. Basically, that means your neighborhood area network goes down to the meter, and you have, a, you have literally two radios in that meter. Uh, and that second radio goes to some other network, like a Wi-Fi network or a Zigbee network below that meter. Turns out that's, that's problematic when you talk about the time scales that we're, we're discussing here for Smart Grid. So we talked earlier about you know, a meter goes in for 30 years. Your thermostat's going to evolve every two years all of a sudden you have an asset that's installed on somebody's home that can't be changed out uh, cost-effectively in order to keep up with that. And it turns out that there's other architectures that are, are gaining interest in the industry right now, like making a thermostat the gateway. That makes sense, right? So as the technology changes for the consumer, you just replace the thermostat. No big deal. The meter stays in place where it was. You don't have to roll another truck. Um, so the old way of kind of doing smart grid was really treating the, the meter uh, as a portal and literally having uh, separate networks between the home area network and 
uh, the neighborhood area network. That's migrating to making other devices, like thermostats act as gateways. Uh, you also have uh, gateways that might look like your internet router. Now, I know there's a project here at UC Berkeley that's, that's looking at reference designs for gateways. It's, it's probably one of the hottest topics right now in smart grid. Uh, so much so that uh, NIST uh, has entire sections of standards devoted to where this gateway goes. Is it in the meter? Is it somewhere else? And even uh, as recently as two weeks ago, the White House got involved. So the White House two weeks ago basically came out with a big RFP that said, whoa, 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 whoa. We're giving away $4.5 billion. Uh, first, first things first, how are we going to enable consumers? So the White House is now even asking, where does this gateway go? There's something else that comes into to the architecture in the smart grid in the home area network, and it's really around how do you design products, uh, not so much from a networking architecture, but from a product design architecture to facilitate high rates of innovation of devices versus the network that has to kind of stay stable for, for longer periods of time. Uh, USNAP is uh, a standard that's emerging. It's basically uh, a USB device for smart grid uh, devices. So think of it as USB for smart grid devices. It's, it looks like one of these little modules. You would plug it into a thermostat. You would plug it into uh, your, your smart inverter for your photovoltaic system. Um, and it's protocol agnostic. So it doesn't matter whether it's Zigbee or Z-Wave or Wi-Fi or anything else. Uh, if protocol agnostic provides all the connectivity you need. Uh, I'll note that this, this technology that's um, emerging in, in the industry right now and being adopted was actually the, the spin-out of a project here at UC Berkeley about five years ago. So now you have gateways all over the home. You have modules that you can plug into devices so that after a few years you can change out the module when a new one is available. And what you see is the way devices are evolving really is you had devices that were kind of aligned with utility visions a few years ago. And now you have devices that have two of these little use not modules on the back, which means on one side you plug in, let's say, the, the neighborhood area network. Uh, and on the other side, you plug in whatever one that you want to buy, like a Zigbee network or a Wi-Fi network. And whenever that technology changes, you simply just pull one module out, stick the other module in. So just to summarize here, the home area network is, is one of the more interesting areas, I think, in the smart grid because there are basically four different architectures uh, to go with. You have meters as gateways, uh, in-home devices as gateways like the thermostat. You have thermostats, that third one there, that are neighborhood area network devices like we deployed at Louisville Gas and Electric. And then you have devices that are, I call them dual access. So that's a, that's a load controller. It basically is a wireless relay that allows you to turn off your air conditioning unit. But those devices have two radios. They have a neighborhood area network and an alternative neighborhood area network, like a VHF paging system. So you have four different architectures here in the home area network. So if we zoom way back up, and this is the last slide, we've kind of gone through you know, the, the wide area network with distribution automation uh, applications, the, the neighborhood area network with the, the smart meters, and then down into the home area network, which conceptually is below that that neighborhood area network, but as we saw, there's a number of different architectures that, that you can use. So with that, um, I'll leave this picture up. That's the end of the talk. Uh, I really hope that, that we can spur on some discussion here. I'm, I'm happy to talk about technology, policy, uh, what's going on in Washington, D.C. now, any of the above. Sure. Great. Thank you for a great talk, Nick. OK, I'm going to open the floor to questions. I have one. I saw in your <coughs> protocol list, uh, Lawnworks, um, I didn't see BACnet. Is BACnet um, uh, heading, heading uh, off to the sunset? Uh, I believe BACnet is listed on the NIST list. I'm not sure if it's whether it's an approved standard or one that needs more uh, looking at. They have two classifications. It, it is on there, I believe. Any more questions? Let me get Dave Watson back here. Uh, Dave Watson, Lawrence Berkeley Lab. Uh, I have a question about accessing the meter data. Do, does uh, Trillion support uh, the customer who has ownership of that data, of course? Do they support accessing it directly from the meter, or is it from a remotely hosted site? 
Great question. And what, and what are the security ramifications, latency, and other issues associated with those two choices? Uh, that's a great question. So uh, just to frame the question, so you're, you're putting this meter into somebody's home, my home, your home, and the whole proposition around smart grid was the consumer is going to be more informed. They're going to be able to understand what, they're, what the meter is reading on an hourly basis. And, and because they're going to be charged potentially on, on time variable pricing, they're going to have all this information and they're going to make these economic decisions that are best for them. And it brings up this whole question around uh, data ownership, who owns the meter data, uh, privacy, uh, data access, the right to access that information, and how do you actually do it? So from a technology standpoint, there's three big components in a smart grid system. So Trillian absolutely believes that the consumer should have both near real-time data, which means that your in-home display might connect up locally to that meter and get readings every few minutes. So we enable that. That meter data goes up to uh, the utility once a day. And that's a second kind of data. So through web services on the back end, that data can be made available. And that's kind of like if I wanted to see what I used yesterday. It might have some data missing uh, for, for wireless communication reasons. It might have some data missing because the processes weren't in place. They're, they're, they typically uh, refine that data set a little bit before they go to billing. So the second kind of data access is through web services uh, for yesterday's data. And then the third kind of data access that consumers should have access to is through uh, kind of the historical information. So that's a web service that you might be able to go interface with and get things like, what was my meter data last month or all of last year? And this is really kind of where the data is that, that you get your bill from. So to answer your question concisely, there's, there's three kinds of data uh, you can get from a smart meter. One is near real time. We support that uh, in the Trillion architecture. Uh, next is kind of day before, which is a web services access, and then the month before, which is also a web services access. Okay. Over there. I have a question about consumers sure. and their acceptability of this. Mm -hmm. So in the Louisville, Kentucky one where you had the the thermostat and turning off the air conditioning. So mm -hmm. you're hitting certain loads and you decide that this block no longer has air conditionings on. How do consumers decide that I'm going to not ever let you turn off my fridge, my freezer with 3,000 pounds of beef in it, um, but you can turn off the attic fan? You can, I mean, how do you expect humans to determine these policies and install these devices intelligently in their own homes? That's a great question. Um, there's, there's a number of answers uh, from, from, a, from a policy standpoint. There, there's two big ones. One is um, consumers should always be given preferences on how these devices behave. So uh, the second is for most things, consumers should have uh, the right to opt out. So typically the way it would work is uh, I would get one of these thermostats, and the agreement is I'm going to go on these special kinds of tariffs. And I, I'm kind of signing a contract with my service provider. But I should always have the right to opt out. Basically, that means in, in the Trillion solution, uh, you can go and, and go online and, and say through a web portal, I want my thermostat to change up four degrees on a critical peak pricing event. Uh, or I changed my mind, and this month I don't want to, so I'm going to go online and, and change how my device behaves. So there's always... We call them customer preferences. So the customer should always have a way to set their preferences on those devices. There are some cases where if the customer has opted into programs that help maintain reliability of the grid, you may not want them to opt out because you've, you've based certain uh, utility decisions on that. Typically, it's, it's seen as if the customer signs into that kind of contract uh, with the utility, like you've signed on to the right plan that you're basically agreeing to, to those. Those typically don't happen that often, uh, so it's not, it's not a, a really a, a customer harmful uh, issue. It's really, uh, there's sometimes when you, if, if you sign the contract and the utility thinks they're going to get a certain response, then, then that contract should be upheld. But for 99% of the cases, customers should be able to opt out of all, the, all, all events, and customers should have the right to set their own preferences. Do we have any questions from the, from the web? No questions from the web, okay. Hi, Nate. Phil Blue from Husk. Good to see you. Good to see you. Um, I just wanted some clarification for the, when you said the home area network device mm -hmm. as a portal. 
Right. Does, does that mean that uh, the like a thermostat would actually be the, the only way the house communicate with the ne neighborhood area network, and so the meter wouldn't wouldn't send the information back. The port, the meter would just feed the information to that smart to that uh, home area network device as a portal, and the portal would interface with the network and the utility. That's exactly right. So in, in the case, so in Louisville, where we deployed those thermostats that were uh, neighborhood area network nodes, they were just like the the meter. So they, they formed this mesh network. They were all networking peers. So the, the, the communications did not necessarily have to go through that meter to get back out to the head end. How the mesh formed, it may coincidentally be that the, the meter routes that thermostat information back through or vice versa. But they, they are, they're, uh, they're network peers in that mesh network. Sure, let's, let's go back there and then we'll come to the front. Yeah. Hello. Uh, can you tell us what is going on in Washington about the, the standards on, uh, I mean, what are they doing about it? I'm doing about? No, no, I, the, the standards. Standards? Yeah. Sure. Uh, so a few years ago, uh, Congress basically charged the National Institute of Standards and Technology to go and uh, look what standards exist in the world and how they could uh, be leveraged to support the smart grid. So this spans all things. So wireless things like IEEE standards, all the way up to um, you know standards like SOAP XML and, and you know IETF and, and web services standards. So it was, it was the full gamut of, of standards. So what NIST did, uh, and they're still in the process of doing, is a three-phase plan. So. Phase one was just completed a few months ago. It was basically uh, evaluation, kind of a market survey of all the standards out there. And they, this was an open process, so uh, companies and industry were all involved in it. And they came up with a big list of standards. And they said, okay, there's, and it ended up, I think, being roughly you know, 25 uh, standards that they said, we can take these and use them immediately in the smart grid. And then there's another mm, 25 or 50 that they said, well, these look interesting. We need to look at them a little bit more. We might have to flush them out. So there's about 50 to 75 standards right now identified by NIST. So that was phase one. It was just identification. Phase two is coordination and development of those standards. So there are some gaps that we're missing in them. So you know, two standards might have share a same concept. You need to reconcile those two standards. So that's where we are right now. That'll last for, I believe it's maybe a year uh, or so. The third phase in the NIST process will be developing testing and certification. So coming up with the right processes to make sure that if you took 45 different standards and created a solution out of that, that you could test everything from end to end and make sure it's interoperable. So it's a three-phase plan that NIST is, is going through right now. Uh, I, don't, I don't have that data off the top of my head. There's a, I would recommend going to the, the NIST website. There's, they have a wiki, and, and all the dates are published. It's, it's open. You, you can participate as an individual, even. I'm interested in how you make the, uh, the, the system secure against tampering. Right. I know that uh, electromechanical meters have many uh, design, design things that in there to uh, keep customers from tampering with the meter and slowing them down or turning them back backwards. If you're sending billing data over a wireless link, then there's going to be a large motivation to try to hack that data and falsify it. That's a great question. Um, I'll, I'll, let me answer that the first part about security. And, and really, it's, it's in the context of what NIST and, and many of the people are looking at, which is cybersecurity. I'll, I'll go in a little bit further after I answer the first question, because it really goes into privacy and, and how you not only architect networks, but how you architect applications. So for your first question, cybersecurity, big issue, absolutely. Um, it's, it's, it's one thing to not get somebody's bill or, or even to, to get somebody's bill data for, from an attacker. It's, also, uh, a huge issue where you have mission critical things. So if you can go and touch reclosers, you can bring the grid down. So this is, this is a very, very hot, hot topic issue. 
is absolutely being addressed right now by all the major communication vendors uh, in, in the industry. Uh, what Trillion does, uh, and there are, there are many standards bodies who work on different aspects from encryption to key exchange to, to all the different uh, aspects of it. Uh, we use uh, open standards uh, uh, for our security. So there's a meter standard called ANSI C12, and that defines certain types of encryption and certain types of key exchanges. So these are, these are open, open standards. So we implement those. So that gives you encryption and key exchange. From a wireless communication standpoint, that is you know, the, the standard approach for it. So encryption and keys and, and understanding the, the right attack vectors and, and building that in. This involves, or the smart grid involves, physical assets. So there's a whole other body of work about how you secure physical assets. So this is business processes, having the fence built around the equipment, that, that kind of stuff. So, so from a security standpoint, both cyber and physical, there, there are things and technologies that are being addressed, and, and Trillion implements those and is aligned with all the open standards being involved. There's a whole other aspect that, that people haven't really thought about yet, and it's really in the consumer domain that this, this applies to. Uh, and it's relevant because there's folks here at UC Berkeley that are looking at this. Uh, Deirdre Mulligan at the law school is looking at privacy issues. I know that there's a number of people in the computer science department looking at, at this kind of aspect, but here's the general idea. Cybersecurity, you can encrypt, you can do key exchanges, you can do all that. Taking a, taking a, a, a pessimistic view of that, it's, it's a question about when, not if, that gets compromised. So from a consumer standpoint, what you want is applications that preserve your privacy built in at the application level. So I'll give you an example. Um, thermostats. Some of the thermostats are recording uh, hourly data for weeks and months on time. And if you had that and you were an attacker, you could deduce when I was home, when I was not, what my, you know, what my schedule might be. Now, I know there's folks looking at, do you really need to send all that data? Right? What are the applications? So demand response. Don't really need to know it. All you really need to know is the maximum power being drawn. So examples like that really lend to the, what I think will be the next uh, phase of innovation. Once we get all the cybersecurity stuff, uh, finished off, which we're close to doing, we'll be addressing it from privacy from an application standpoint. So getting much more sophisticated on what kinds of information we exchange and the transactions that go on to support those kinds of applications like demand response, energy efficiency, participation in carbon markets as an individual. Uh, so that will be the next phase of innovation. Excellent question. Uh, this is Lemon's question. Uh, in the, uh, it's about maintenance. In the past, everything before the meter belongs to PGA to maintain, and after meter belong to me. Now you have control of my appliances. Then, for example, just that thermostat. there. Okay, who's responsible? You are using it, and if it's broken, who's going to pay for it to to maintain that thing? So all, all other appliances. My AC, you turn it on, turn it off right. so many times, it's broken. Who's going to pay for that? Right, right. Another, another great question, and it's, and it's these kinds of questions when, when you really get down to the, to the nitty-gritty details of deploying this and, and letting consumers participate in all these new opportunities that you really do have to face. And, and, and frankly, utilities have not, been, uh, have not addressed these kinds of issues in the past. It's always been the meter is it, house side, and then meter side. And that was a great you know, logical divide and, and real world divide. And this kind of comes back to the questions about uh, consumers opting in and having the right. Um, the answer is, is not clean and cut. The answer is there will be certain devices that are utility owned. So for example, the load controllers, those little gray boxes that you might install outside of your house next to your air conditioner to turn it off, those might be utility owned, utility maintained. You might participate in that program as a consumer and, and allow somebody to come install that in your home. It gets a little trickier when you talk about thermostats. So thermostats, is, is, uh, thermostats are, are an interesting uh, issue because you can basically buy a thermostat in two ways. You can go to Home Depot and buy it, or you can have it sent from a utility or service provider. 
Now, traditionally, um, programs have, have given the, the ownership to the consumer. So current load, load control programs today and service providers give that uh, thermostat to the consumer. So if they have a problem with that thermostat, they call that service provider, usually not a utility. Uh, it's unlike TiVo where, or cable where you're actually leasing that box. Going forward, you're going to see an increasing amount of consumers buying smart grid-enabled devices, like these washing machines and, and bigger and better thermostats and all that kind of stuff. And it turns out there's a really simple answer, and we've seen it already, and that's those USENAP modules. So not only does USENAP module help you address the technology innovation problem, it also allows you to maintain a very uh, clean line, literally, about how to, how to segment, what's, segment what's utility owned, which would be the module, versus what's consumer owned, which is the thermostat that accepts that communications module. Now, of course, the behavior is part of the program that utility has to, to uh, ensure that, that works properly. Um, but the good news is there are technology design patterns like that USENAP module that address just this issue that, that does plague a lot of the, the conversations we talk about enabling consumers in this market space. Well, thank you very much, Nate. I think. Uh, thank you, everyone. We also have a very positive uh, talk.